We do have uh, Deputy Mountjoy still on the stand, subject to direct by Mr. Smith and all 12 plus 2 in the box. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see you all back. I'm sorry. I, I stand corrected, Counselor. Mr. Terry, if you'd like to continue. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Good morning, Deputy Mountjoy. Good morning, sir. Uh, Deputy Mountjoy, um, at the end of yesterday, we were talking about uh, the cell phone records and your interpretation of them. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And I, I wanted to clarify some points. In looking at uh, the condensed version or the uh, ones that uh, you extracted that are part of People's Exhibit 20, there's a reference where it says duration in minutes. Is that right? On that spreadsheet? That's correct. And then there's also uh, a data size column on that spreadsheet? It depends on which spreadsheet you're referring to. Well, I was talking about the spreadsheet from the cell phone records that you examined that were the dates of May 23rd, April 25th, and August 16th through 17th that uh, you were examined on by Mr. Smith. Correct. I'd like to make a correction. That wasn't in minutes, it's in seconds. Um, but there is a uh, data column. Or correction, did I say that backwards? I believe it's in uh, seconds, not minutes. Um, I'm going based on what I'm looking at, which is uh, People's Exhibit 20, which is, uh, indicates that it's in minutes in the, that column. So that would be incorrect. If it says minutes, it's actually seconds. I, I would have to see it. Is this the spreadsheet we were talking about earlier? Can you scroll all the way to the top? Sure. Yes, it is. Okay. That is not the redacted form, that's the original. It starts on August 16th, 2014, does it not? I, I can hardly see it from here, so I'm not sure. If, that, if you need to come closer, please, to examine it, please do so. Now I can see the start time column now. Yes, it says 8:16. So that would be actually the redacted since it doesn't cover June to September, right? That's correct. Okay. It says in this column, duration in minutes. Is that right? Yes, it does. Often on T-Mobile, there will also be another column that will show seconds. Okay. But in this case, this is translating any seconds into actually minutes under this particular spreadsheet? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> now, with regards to that, there's also next to that in the next column, it says data size. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, and that's if there's data being transmitted of some type? It could depend on the type of messaging that goes through, whether it be an iMessage or a uh, actual SMS. Okay. Now, what is the um, measurement uh, with regards to the, that particular, as far as, are we talking uh, kilobytes, uh, are we talking megabytes, are we talking terabytes, what what size are we talking about as far as how that is measured? 
If you know. I do know. So, for example, on the third column down, that was a call that you had selected out as being calls between Sabrina Lamone and Jonathan Hearn. Is that right? The third column down? Yes, sir. So these are all calls that were supposedly between their two phones, right? That's correct. Okay. So the third column down from the top, you've got zero minutes for that particular contact, if you will, between the two phones. Is that right? Are you talking about the third row down? Yes, I'm sorry. I have misspoken. Third row down from the top. That's correct. So that shows zero minutes of actual contact, at least by voice, right? That you can tell. That's correct, yeah. But there's data size of one. What does that integer represent? That could be a few things. That could be uh, a voicemail. Um, it could have been a call not answered. Uh, it could be a number of things. Okay, so in other words, it's a good possibility that that was a call that was it was a call that was never picked up, right? That's correct. But again, these are part of the contacts that you included in your calculations as the number of times that Sabrina Lamone and Jonathan Hearn were contacting each other, right? When you were coming up with your calculations. That is correct. that you saw Jonathan Hearn and Sabrina Lamone meeting up with each other either at the yogurt shop or at the uh, pizzeria. Um, you said it was in Apple Valley. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, and at that time Ms. Lamone was residing in uh, Silver Lakes. Is that right? Yes, in Helena. Okay. And uh, Mr. Hearn was living in um, Hesperia. That is correct. Okay. And he was working in Redlands. Correct. Okay. Where is Apple Valley, if you will, in relationship to those locations? It would be in between um, Hellendale and Hesperia. So somewhere in between. Yes. And you don't recall how long after Robert Lamont's death that you made these observations, is that right? The pizza shop, the round table pizza, that was uh, during the wiretap, so that would be November sometime. Okay. Shortly before they were both arrested in November? That's correct. Okay. And that was of 2014, correct? Yes, it was. And with regard to the yogurt shop, was that after you saw him in the pizzeria, or was that before? I believe that was after. Again, in November of 2014. Correct. With regards to the, the phone calls, time of April 25th of 2014 and August 17th of 2014, you don't have any recordings of what those what was being said during those phone calls, is that right? No, no, I do not. In other words, there was no wiretap on them at that time. 
That's correct. Thank you. I have no further questions at this time, Your Honor. Smith. Attention to the screen uh, about Peoples 20. Now you were asked specifically about the May or the August 16th, 17, 2014, uh, from 760 987 3569, just now by the defense attorney. That's correct. Okay. Now, just as practice, the Excel spreadsheet, the records read from left to right? That's correct. Okay. So if you were to follow a particular call, how would you do that? I'm going to scroll up to the top. Uh, if you were to analyze a Excel spreadsheet from a received record, how would you analyze one particular call? First, you'd look at what's uh, commonly referred to as the MISDN, which is the uh, MSISDN right there. That's basically just the phone number. Um, you would take that, look at this your target number, move over. A lot of times you don't need to reference like the IMEI, um, IMSI, stuff like that. Um, you just continue to move to the right just as if you're reading. So look for the date and time, uh, what the number was connected to, uh, what tower is connected to, what network, um, and what type of call or service it was. Okay. So if I was to highlight the, uh, the first one, uh, that would be um, from... August 16, 2014 at 12.10 a.m., correct? That's correct. Okay. What type of connection is that between the phones? Where it says event type. I'm trying. It's a SMS. Okay. What does SMS mean? That's It's a text message. Okay. So scrolling all the way over to the right uh, where you're at duration and it says zero, uh, why does it say zero if it's a text message? Because it's not connected for any minutes or seconds, it's strictly data. Okay. Moving back to the next line down, from August 16, 2014, again 12, 10, and 21 seconds. Uh, what is the event type for that connection? That too is an SMS um, short message, um, which is a text message. Okay. Again, scrolling all the way over to the right. Under duration, it says zero. What's the significance of that? Again, there was no minutes or seconds the phone was connected. It's just strictly data. Okay. Then highlighting the remainder, um, where it says SMS, are all of those going to read zero in duration? That's correct. Yes, sir. Scrolling down, this is People's 20. And there's also what is labeled as event type MMS. Uh, what does that mean? That's a multimedia message, okay. which is a picture mail or anything of that sort. Okay. Now scrolling over to that location, the duration is zero. And the significance of that? Again, the phone is not uh, connected for a phone call, so it's going to show zero minutes or seconds. Okay. So for a text message or a multimedia message, there is no uh, voice connection, so it will always show zero. That's correct. Okay. Under data size for the multimedia message, it's 268,898. Uh, what's the significance of that? Uh, it shows that it's strictly, or I'm sorry, significantly larger than an SMS message, which is just words. Um, so the data is naturally going to be higher because it's a picture mail. Moving on to the screen, that's marked May 23rd, 2014, um, to the highlighted line uh, where it says event type. Uh, 
What does it say? Voice. Significance <clears throat> of that? It's a voice phone call. Okay. Now, if you were to scroll over to the duration part, it says 99.13. Significance of that? Uh, that's the amount of time that the phone was connected to the other device. So for a voice, a voice call in the T-Mobile records, what is shown under duration? It'll show the, the duration of the time that is connected. Um, if you scroll to the top, it'll actually say whether it's minutes or seconds. Okay. Now all the other calls that have 0.00, .00 those are connections between the phones, but text messages or multimedia messages. That's correct. And sometimes uh, a Wi-Fi phone call can show up like that. So as the text messages and multimedia messages, which uh, show up as duration zero, did you count those uh, for connections between the phones? Absolutely. Moving on to People's 19A. Are you able to see that from where you're at? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> what are these, or what does this show? It looks like the top two are uh, called detail records in Excel format um, for different uh, time periods. Uh, the third thing down is uh, called detail records, but without cell sites. And uh, the fourth one down is going to be the court order. Um, Fifth one down is going to be uh, uh, all the subscriber information, so it'll be name, date of birth, address of whomever the phone is registered under. And I, oh, the fourth one looks like it's going to be an expanded format of that as well, of the uh, subscriber information. So this is the cellular phone records in their entirety uh, for that cellular phone? That's correct. <clears throat> Are these the records that you reviewed uh, to check or contact between the two phones you've testified about? Yes. This third one down, you said that is uh, relating to phone calls without cell tower information? That's correct. It's more for like billing purposes. Okay. Uh, when you provided the time frame of November 22nd, 13 through, I believe, March, that's from these records? That is correct. Now, these records, I'm sorry, good. Do they denote what type of either text or phone call is being made? They distinguish between the two, yes, but not necessarily what type of phone call, if it's a VoIP call or something of that sort. Okay. These records where it says uh, text, that signifies a text message between that phone and whatever other phone? Yes, it does. Okay, where it says picture, what does that mean? That's an MMS message. Okay. And these call types without any text or picture, what's the significance of that information? Are these uh, phone calls, like voice calls? Yes, they are. Nothing further, Your Honor. Sure. Thank you, Your People call Joseph Gates. Thomas. Thomas Gates, Your Honor. I apologize. Thank 
If you step up to the podium, raise your right hand before him. Yes, I do. Come on up, have a seat, please. Good morning, sir. Can you tell us your name and spell your last name for the record? Uh, good morning. First name is Thomas, T-H-O-M-A-S, last of Gates, G-A-T-E-S. Your witness, John. How are you currently employed? Currently employed with the BNSF Railway Police Department. How long have you been employed with the police department for the railroad? I've been with the railroad police department for a total of five years. Now, as law enforcement for the railroad, what are your primary duties? Uh, my current assignment is a police captain in charge of the investigations team. Uh, primary roles and responsibilities of the railroad police is uh, policing the railroad, um, providing protection to our facilities, um, providing police enforcement along the tracks and uh, any other enforcement investigations that would be done. Now, were you called in to assist in the investigation uh, relating to the murder of Robert Lamont? Yes, I was. How long after the murder occurred were you uh, called on to assist? Uh, the following day. Now, who was your primary point of contact uh, in assisting with the investigation? I was assigned as the liaison for my police department, and I was to uh, assist Detective Meyer with any tasks that he needed. Now, if you could describe uh, what steps you took to assist in the investigation. So early on in the investigation, uh, we realized that with the railroad being such a unique organization, that there were going to be a lot of questions related to um, railroad work in general, um, facilities, personnel, um, and being an investigations team working specialized investigations, we also thought it would be important to have one of us assigned to the investigation should they need any additional investigative assistance. Okay. Now, did you provide any information for items that were either taken uh, taken from the shop in Tehachapi or you believe to have been taken? Uh, yes. Um, early on in the investigation, uh, one of the significant uh, things that I assisted with was um, researching and providing information on a uh, stolen laptop computer. And how did you, uh, what did you use to do the research? So within our organization, we have our own IT department. And uh, usually when a laptop computer is issued, it's assigned a specific number. And that specific number is the profile for that computer. And usually whoever it's issued to, it'll tell us everything we need to know about that computer. When it was issued, if it's ever lost or stolen, um, when it needs to be refreshed and a new computer issued, things of that nature. Did you also assist in uh, accessing some surveillance footage? Yes, sir, I did. Okay. Uh, where did you get the surveillance footage from? I traveled to the Pilot Travel Center located at 5725 uh, Highway 58 in the city of Boron, California. And why did you go to that location? At the point in the investigation where I went to look for video surveillance, uh, Detective Meyer and I had spoke, and we were trying to determine uh, paths of, of travel that could have been taken um, for the person of interest leaving the scene of the homicide. Okay. Now, just where is Kramer Junction in relation to a possible path of travel from Tehachapi? Kramer Junction. Um, would be the halfway point between the high desert and uh, the Tehachapi area. And your subject of interest at the time, uh, did you believe that they resided in Hesperia? Yes. Did you also interview a John Justice? I did, yes. Did you author a report? I did, yes. 
part of your duties, did you also review phone records? I did, yes. Whose phone records did you review? I reviewed the phone records of Jonathan Hearn, uh, his primary cell phone, the primary cell phone for Sabrina Lamone, and what was being referred to as a secondary or burner phone, uh, which we believe to belong to Sabrina Lamone. Okay. How did you create a uh, PowerPoint, I guess, slide set for those records? I did, yes. Okay, what time frame did you create that, uh, that PowerPoint? The area that I focused most on was between August 1st of 2014 and August uh, 31st. Your Honor, if I may approach, I have an item marked. start with people's, I believe, 22. If you could look on the back, too. I do have that in front of me. Okay. Uh, what is that a photograph of? It's a photograph of uh, overview of a Toshiba laptop computer. Now, there are some markings, I believe, to the bottom left. Can you describe those uh, markings or tags? Yeah, so these are two tags. Uh, the top one, um, it says that it's property of BNSF. What this is, it's what we refer to as an asset tag number. Uh, the number on this tag is what I was explaining about uh, the computer's basically profile. So if I were to want to know any information on this particular computer, I'd run it through the IT department and they'd provide me a profile. Okay. And the uh, other tag? on there? Um, the other tag, it's a secondary tag that I'm not familiar with. What does the secondary tag that you're not familiar with say? Uh, what it says is uh, report changes to, and it says uh, use your normal procedures to coordinate equipment moves via telecom or facilities. When equipment is reassigned to a new person or location, complete corporation form number, then it gives the form number with updated information. An email to inventory, um, comma, ISS, asset. I'm moving on to People's 21. If you could review that, please. I do, sir, yes. What is that item? Uh, this is a portion of the PowerPoint presentation uh, that I completed for Detective Meyer. Okay. Well, Your Honor, I would request People's 21 be moved into evidence at this time, be allowed to publish. Mr. Chair, have you seen it? I've seen it, Your Honor. Um, I'll submit it. Could be moved. with page one, equals 21. Just 
describe first what type of information we're looking at and how you laid out the PowerPoint. Yeah, so we quickly looked at two numbers in particular. The first one belonged to Jonathan Hearn. That's the 760-987-3569 number. That was his personal cell phone. We also were focused on uh, what we believed was the secondary or burner phone for Ms. Lamone, which was 760-998-7958. And through the PowerPoint, just so we're clear, I'll refer to Jonathan Hearn's phone as Jonathan Hearn, and the other number is the secondary number, for clarification. Now, when you were going through the records for August, did you do that by filtering in Excel, or did you do it by So... Uh, with the call detail records, um, when we receive them as law enforcement, it's laid out on an Excel spreadsheet. Um, so what my team did and myself did is we manually counted um, calls and text messages between the two numbers. If you could just start with the header where it says August 1, 2014 to August 13, 2014, and what were your findings? We found that during August uh, 1st, 2014 to August 13, there was 1,605 text messages sent between uh, the Jonathan Hearn's primary phone and the secondary phone. And on average, it's about 114 text messages uh, per day, give or take each day, and uh, approximately 117 multimedia messages. We found during the, this time there was approximately 204 text messages sent and received between the two phones uh, to include multimedia messages. And then also for August 16, which is that second portion. We found a total of 93 text messages uh, between the two phones. Moving on to page three. What are your findings for August 17? We found that there was a phone call at approximately uh, 12 in the afternoon uh, incoming from the secondary phone. On this day, uh, significant text messages that were interesting in nature to us, um, there were a total of eight uh, at various times, uh, 126 in the afternoon, 422, 422, 5.01 p.m., 5.04 p.m., and 6.57 p.m. And then an additional call at uh, 7.50 p.m. Where was that call from? Was that from Jonathan Hearn to the other phone or from the other phone to Jonathan? It was the secondary phone phoning Jonathan Hearn. Moving on to slide four, August 17, 2014 continued. We found that between 7.50 p.m., and uh, 8.37, there's a total of four text messages um, outgoing and then one incoming to the secondary number. So Jonathan Hearn sent three and, or I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. There were three text messages sent from the uh, secondary phone and one incoming to that phone. And then we had a uh, outgoing phone call at 8.37 p.m. And then we had uh, significant text messages between 8.38 p.m. to the next morning, which would be 6.48. Total of 56 messages to and from the, the target numbers. on to page five. Labeled August 18, 2014 to August 27, 2014. Uh, what are your findings? Yeah, we found that on August 18, 2014, there was a total of uh, 97 text messages. And uh, we also determined that Jonathan Hearn had called what was later determined to be the landline phone number of the Lamone residence and that they had a 134-minute conversation. Awesome. Moving on to August 19th uh, through the 22nd, um, we found that there were a total of 312 messages back and forth 
with one multimedia text message. And then moving on to August 23rd through the 27th, uh, we found uh, 307 text messages to include multimedia messages. Moving on to page six, uh, labeled August 28th, 2014 to August 31, 2014. If you could give your findings, please. Sure, a breakdown of each day on August 28, 2014, there was a total of 55 text messages between the two phones. On August 29th, there was a total of 53 text messages. On August 30th, there was a total of 30 text messages. And then on August 31st, there was a total of 95 text messages. Moving on to page seven labeled as information overview. Uh, what were your total findings for the month of August 2014? Uh, for the total month, we found that there was approximately 2,493 text messages between the two phones and approximately 120 phone calls. Good morning, Mr. Gates. Good morning, sir. Uh, Mr. Gates, uh, you talked about doing all this analysis on the number of calls that were made uh, during certain time periods, right? That's correct. And a lot of uh, discussion about text messages being sent back and forth, right? That's correct. Did you ever examine those text messages? The actual content? Yes, sir. No, sir, I did not. Okay. So you don't know what they were communicating back and forth? That is correct. I do not. Okay. Now, with regards to the phone calls that were made back and forth, you don't know what they were discussing then either? I do not, sir. Yes, sir, I did. And that's the only interview you conducted yourself? Yes, sir. Okay. And with regards to uh, your work on the case, it was limited to reviewing the cell phone records and calculating how many phone calls and how many text messages were actually sent? We did quite a bit of assisting to Kern County, um, give or take what you outlined and maybe more. Now, um, as a part of that, can you tell me uh, if you know, uh, on an annual basis, what was Rob Lamont making per month with the railroad? How much did he earn? Unfortunately, I don't have that information. You're unaware as to what his annual income was. Would that be accurate? That is correct. I do not know. Thank you. I have nothing further. Step down, Mr. Gates. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Sir, could you step up to the podium for me there? Please raise your right hand and be sworn. I do. Come on up, have a seat.
Good morning, sir. Can you tell us your name and spell your last name for the record? Good morning, Nicholas Aaron Denny, D-E-N-N-Y. Thank you. Your witness, counsel. How are you currently employed? With BNSF Railway. How long have you worked for BNSF? Going on my 15th year. What is your current uh, job title? Mechanical Foreman 2. Now, as a mechanical foreman, too, what are your duties? Uh, I supervise three different locations, uh, Tehachapi, Fresno, and Bakersfield, California, mechanical department. Now, when you say supervise, what does that mean? What, what do you do in relation to the other employees? Uh, I manage uh, a group of 10 people total. As part of that management, do you uh, schedule? The employees, what time they work, what shifts they're on? I do. Do you do that for the rapid responders in Tehachapi? Uh, to an extent. Those guys are mechanical foremen as well. Okay. Now, for scheduling purposes, do you create a spreadsheet uh, when people are working who's available to do relief duty uh, for Tehachapi or mm -hmm. have you? Yes. Okay. Did you do that in 2014? Um, I oversaw the schedule in 2014. I did not make the Excel, the, uh, excuse me, the Excel spreadsheet. Okay. Your Honor, if I may approach, I have an item marked. Please. Um, you got different months. Okay. Uh, what months are contained within the uh, three work schedules? You got April, uh, May, and August. Okay. And those all three months are all from 2014. I'm just starting with April. Who were the th four primary rapid responders that worked uh, in Tehachapi uh, based on the work schedule? It was Corey Hamilton, Sean Ware, uh, Dennis Stankovich, and Ryan Galindo. Now, who were the relief responders in the month of April? Uh, we had two back then, which was John Justice and Rob Lamont, Robert Lamont. Now, how is the uh, work schedule laid out? Uh, it just basically gives you uh, the date all the way to the end of the month, so okay. 30 days. It, t it tells you uh, who's on the night shift, who's on the day shift. Okay. And so it goes day by day, who works what shift? Correct. Okay. And then if a relief responder was to, uh, let's say, uh, John Justice was to work for Corey Hamilton, how would that spreadsheet get changed? What information would be put in? Um, so if a relief would come up, um, he might be there for to cover for a sick day, vacation day, training day. So if we were utilizing relief staff, it would go down as um, like what they were there for. So if, if someone was out on vacation, we would log it as such. Moving on to uh, May, uh, the second page. Is, uh, is that work schedule laid out in the same fashion to what you've just testified to? Yes, it is. Okay, and then the last August 2014, uh, same work schedule, different month, correct? Correct. Any objection? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, there's no foundation laid for this uh, by this witness with regard to the mission that he didn't prepare the spreadsheet. Mr. 
Schmidt? I could do some follow-up, Your Honor. Go ahead. Uh, the spreadsheet that's currently marked as People's 23, is that kept in the regular course of business for BNSF Railroad? Objection, Mark, foundation. Overruled. That means you can answer. If you're not sure, look at me. You can answer. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yes, we, we have it saved in our database. Okay. Who has access to that database? Um, my department, which is the mechanical department, as well as our claims department. So employees of the railroad are the ones that have access uh, to the database and can make changes uh, to the information within the database. Management, yes. Um, that management includes you? Correct. Okay. Now, based on that database, did you then print out the Excel spreadsheet that's currently in front of us uh, in People's 23 and print, uh, provide it to the BNSF police? I did. Okay. Uh, was that for the purpose of the investigation in this case? Yes, sir. Your Honor, I would request People's 23 be moved into evidence at this time. Mr. Cherry? Admitted. Admitted as a business record. Motion uh, Nothing further. Mr. Cherry, Carl? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Um, Mr. Danny, um, I'm a little confused. Now, you testified you didn't actually prepare the spreadsheet. Is that right? In other words, you weren't the one who did the input into that spreadsheet. I'm not really understanding your sure. question. Sure. Were you the one who put input the numbers or the days that people were working on this spreadsheet? In, in 2014, no, I did not. I oh. didn't create that spreadsheet. Okay. You didn't create it? No, I didn't. Okay. So with regards to the content, all you did was go into your program that is in, at BNSF and print out and provide to uh, the BNSF police that spreadsheet, is that right? Correct. Okay. With regards to when someone is um, coming in to relieve uh, a normal rapid responder, in other words, they're kind of substituting in for a sick day or a vacation day, mm -hmm. something along those lines, who inputs into the database the information that they that person was in there substituting for the normal rapid responder? It would be the manager slash rapid responder uh, who would need to get his day covered. So with, if it was for a sick day, vacation day, he could input that, and if he's not available to, he could call me, which I would be the next level in management to input that in. So either the, the actual four responders that you have, the full-time responders there who are taking the time off would either have to input it themselves, because I think you said they're at a management level themselves. Correct. Right? Correct. Or you would have to do it. Yes, sir. Okay. And in this case, you didn't, you weren't the one who input that data into that those spreadsheets, right? No. Okay. Thank you. Nothing for it. Mr. Smith. Nothing else? All right. Step down, Mr. Denny. Thank you. Uh, people call Daniel Flatten Jr. I'm sorry, counsel. Raise your right hand and be sworn, please. You do solemnly state that the testimony you shall give in this matter shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth will help you God. I do. Come on up, have a seat. Good morning, sir. Can you tell us your name and spell your last name for the record? Daniel V. Flatten, Jr., F L A T T E N. How are you currently employed? With the BNSF Railway. What is your job title? General Director of Claims. What is your primary duties, I guess, as General Director of Claims? So the, 
our primary duty is the BNSF Railway Company is a self-insured entity, and we deal with insurance type issues for the company, everything from property damage to personal injuries. Just going to uh, go to a, a general scenario. If somebody is, uh, something happens to a railroad worker on the job, uh, what does BNSF do in response to that? So if something were to happen to a railroad worker on the job, um, railway workers are a little bit different than the rest of the, the country in general in that they are not covered by workers' compensation. They're covered by the Federal Employers' Liability Act. And so in the event an individual was injured at work, the General Claims Department would undertake an investigation of that incident, the circumstances under which it occurred, and make an evaluation with regards to that and attempt to work with the employee to either broker a settlement, take care of them while they were off, and ultimately get them back to work. Is it frequent or infrequent um, that a settlement is reached um, in it, without an attorney, without, with just between the parties? I would say it's something in the neighborhood of about half. Okay. Same question then for what is the standard protocol if somebody uh, is deceased while working for the railroad? So in that scenario, uh, there are certain benefits that an individual who works for a railroad would be entitled to by virtue of working for, the, for a North American railroad. Uh, there would be railroad retirement board benefits, and there would also be benefits that were offered and sponsored by the company. And so in that circumstance, we would make every effort to make contact with that family to explain what those benefits were and to offer any help or assistance that we could in getting them set up with those benefits. And when you say uh, benefits are offered, benefits are provided, uh, what does that mean in general? I mean, is this a large amount of money or is this just assistance uh, with food? Well, as I'd indicated, railroad workers are a little bit different in that we don't pay Social Security. We pay Railroad Retirement Board taxes. And so as a railroad employee who is injured or killed on the job, there are survivor benefits that their minor children and their spouse would be available, that would be available to them through the RRB, which is the federal government. And then there are also internal resources that are available or internal benefits that are available to them by virtue of being a BNSF railway employee, um, a life insurance policy, uh, some continued health and welfare benefits for a finite period of time, things of that nature. Okay. Now, did you make contact with Sabrina Lamone following the death of Robert Lamone? Yes, sir, I did. Okay. Did you recall making initial contact with Ms. Lamone on August 18th, 2014? I believe that is correct, date. yes, sir. And what was the nature of that contact? Uh, was it in person or over the phone? Um, I don't recall that I spoke to her on the phone. I showed up at their residence and we had an in-person meeting. Okay. Um, I don't know that I would have just shown up at the residence without having had contact with somebody. I just don't recall if there was a phone call directly with, with Ms. Lamone or somebody else uh, prior to me showing up. What was the nature of uh, the conversation on August 18, 2014? Uh, I delivered the, the benefits packet that detailed uh, some of the things that we had just talked about, um, as well as uh, 401k expense allocation information that was contained within that. Left my business card, indicated that the BNSF would like to help with funeral expenses if the family so chose and that if there was anything else that, uh, that they needed, that they should feel free to contact myself. I know that offer had been extended by several other supervisors prior to my arrival there, and I also sought to make arrangements for the return of personal property and the vehicle, Mr. Lamone's vehicle. Are you aware of whether or not funeral expenses were paid? Yes, sir, they were. Okay. Did you then return the subsequent day, August 19, 2014? I don't recall. I would have to look. Uh, for purposes of the investigation, did you write an email to a uh, Captain Gates? Yes, sir. Okay. 
I would assist you, it's been three years, in your recollection if you were to review uh, the email that you provided to the captain? It certainly would. Your Honor, if I may approach. Yes. Yes, sir, it appears we did speak on the 19th, on 19 August 2014, um, but I don't believe that conversation was had in person. Okay. Uh, your recollection then it was over the phone? Yes, sir. Okay, do you recall the nature of the conversation? It was a follow-up on the information that I had provided the day before, again, an offer of assistance with regard to uh, expenses and a further offer to when I had initially dropped off that benefits packet on the 18th, um, we didn't delve into the specifics of, of what that contained in an offer to further go through that information. Okay. Is that the extent of the uh, contact? There was also, again, a conversation about getting personal information back, and then I recall there was a conversation about um, Mr. Lamone's paycheck and making sure that that it be paid on schedule. Moving now to September 5th, 2014. Do you recall again making contact with Ms. Lamont? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, where are you based out of? Fort Worth, Texas. So as to the September 5th contact most likely over the phone. <coughs> yes, sir. Okay. Do you recall the nature of that discussion or what was spoken about? We discussed those railroad retirement board benefits that I had mentioned before, uh, as well as in general how the, how the claims process would work. Starting in September, did you have any discussions with Ms. Lamone related to uh, a proposed settlement? We had several discussions where the idea was broached as to how the process would work. Uh, in each of those instances, I indicated that not enough time had elapsed, that there were these benefits to which they were entitled and they needed to make application for, and that until such time as that was done, and while the investigation continued to unfold with the Kern County Sheriff's Department, which who I believe was the primary investigating agency, um, that we needed to pump the brakes on that and allow the process to work. How many times did you uh, say that to Ms. Lamone that, that you needed some time to elapse? At least two that I recall, two separate conversations. Drawing your attention then to October 9th, 2014. Do you recall that contact with Ms. Lamone? I remember it simply in the sense that it's 
highlighted here, and it sounds consistent with several previous conversations. Yes, sir. Uh, that conversation, what uh, did Ms. Lamone want from BNSF Railroad? Uh, the idea of a, of a fair settlement, that Mr. Lamone loved working for the railroad, and that uh, he wouldn't have wanted to have to get an attorney involved or things of that nature to have to deal with it, and that she was just looking for something that was fair. Okay. And what was your response to that? Again, the same, the same basic response as before, that we had to allow some time um, to pass. We had to get these benefits set up so that we could have a realistic understanding of, of what any type of settlement would, could, or should perhaps look like. Okay. Uh, drawing your attention now to October 21st, 2014. Uh, do you recall that conversation with Ms. Lamont? I recall we had conversations about that point in time um, where, in general, some of these same issues were discussed. But as we got further away from the date of the incident, um, we also talked about the idea of brief counseling, particularly for the two children. Okay. So the nature of the conversations in October is Ms. Lamont wanted a fair settlement, and you told her it's too soon to discuss that. Yes, sir, that's my okay. recollection. And then you also brought up the topic of, of grief counseling, both for Ms. Lamone and her two children. Correct. Do you know when the financial settlement with Ms. Lamone was reached? There has been no financial settlement between the BNSF Railway and Mrs. Lamone. Are you aware of whether or not uh, some res uh, survivor benefits were provided? Beyond the basic employee life insurance payment, I am not. Okay. Um, did you handle it beyond your conversations with Ms. Lamone? Did you handle anything? Uh, else relating to Sabrina Lamone or are there other people that you work with? There are other people that I work with. Okay. Right. Nothing further. Thank you. Mr. Terry. with BNSF. So what do you mean by classification? Well, did he have some level of, or was there a level of classification with regards to the uh, income, which would be ba also a basis for some of the benefits? No, sir. The benefits that they would be entitled to via the RRB and the basic employee benefits would be the same, regardless of a, I believe classification is the word you use. Would a supervisor who makes, say, more money get better, more benefits than, say, someone who made less money at a lower level? Their baseline benefits would be the same. As a supervisor, as an exempt officer of the company, you would have the option to buy some additional benefits that aren't available to uh, our scheduled employees. Do you know approximately how much uh, Rob Lamont made annually? Uh, I would be speculating. Now, with regards to uh, the conversations you have with Ms. Lamone, did a lot of it focus on the fact that immediately after uh, Mr. Lamone's death, uh, the health insurance policy was canceled? There, there was a, an issue where the health insurance inadvertently immediately got canceled and we got it shut back or turned back on, yes, sir. Okay. And obviously, Ms. Lamone had uh, two children, right? Yes, sir. And you were aware of that? Yes, sir. And were you aware that uh, Rob Lamone was the primary breadwinner in their family? I believe that to be the case, yes, sir. Okay. And certainly Ms. Lamone would be concerned about being able to pay her bills and to provide for her children. I would think so. Okay, and that would be some of her concern, obviously, yes. since she's, her husband, who was the main breadwinner, was now deceased. Would that yes. be accurate? And you contacted her day after her husband was killed, is that right? 
We met in person the day after her husband was killed, yes, sir. And that was to kind of uh, let her know how the, the, uh, some of the process goes with regards to uh, benefits uh, from the railroad, is that right? Correct, it was to provide a packet of written information that contained the how-to, if you will, of getting those benefits, yes, sir. And obviously, uh, again, this is the day after her husband's been killed, right? Yes, sir. Uh, it's, and then she contacted you subsequent to that because she had some concerns about making sure that she had medical coverage for her children. Is that right? Yes, sir. At some point in time, we had that conversation. And then there are subsequently were conversations about what the death, death benefits would be for her and her children? There were conversations around if she had questions around what those benefits would be and how to make application for them, yes, sir. Which would be a normal thing that someone would do in that type of situation, based on your experience in the job you perform, right? Yes, sir. With regards to the, the uh, uh, life insurance policy, uh, was that, you said that was paid out? I believe it was paid out. Do you know approximately when? I do not. It's administered through MetLife. Do you know who the beneficiaries under the policy were? I do not. Do you know who any of the uh, alternative beneficiaries were under the policy? No, sir, I do not. Now, during the conversation you had with regards to um, the funeral expenses, uh, Ms. Lamone indicated to you that the funeral expenses were, or were going to be about fifteen thousand dollars. Is that right? The BNSF offered to cover funeral expenses up to a pro up to fifteen thousand dollars. Yes, sir. Okay, and she indicated to you that it was less, and that she'd asked if the money could be donated to the church. Is that right? Correct. If there was anything between what it was and what the 15000 covered. Is that right? I believe that's the case, and I believe that's the only time I spoke with Ms. Lamone about the benefits, the balance of the time I was dealing with uh, her sister. Okay. And that would be her sister, Julie? Yes, sir. Okay. So Ms. Lamone said if there was anything, uh, if the funeral cost less than the 15000 she wanted the, 50, the uh, balance to be donated to the church. Is that right? Correct. Now you've indicated that uh, you've not reached any settlement with Ms. Lamone with regards to benefits, uh, survivor benefits, is that right? With regards to a settlement? Yes. No, we have not reached an agreement. Okay. What about our children? Are they receiving any survivor benefits? If they are receiving survivor benefits at this point in time, it would be via the, RR, the Railroad Retirement Board. Okay. But you have no other knowledge as to whether or not her children are being cared for? They are not being cared for financially by the BNSF Railway Company. Okay. No further questions. No. Mr. Flatten, just trying to. Uh, the RRB, that's like Railway Social Security. Is that a fair statement? To a certain extent, yes, sir. Okay. It is rather than paying Social Security benefits, we pay Railroad Retirement Board benefits, uh, and it's a similar system. And the RRB then provides uh, finances to uh, if someone's deceased, to the family, to the children. Correct. If, if application is made, yes, sir. Okay. Now, the settlement, what is the settlement? Where does that come from? A settlement, if it were to be brokered, would that would be an agreement between Mrs. Lamone and the BNSF Railway Company. Okay. Now, if a settlement had been reached, uh, what are we talking about? It would be speculative at this point in time for me to try and quantify that. Have you worked any of these cases before where somebody's killed on the job with BNSF? Unfortunately, I have. Okay. What is the a, a range that you've seen? Well, I have not worked cases where um, 
I have worked cases where employees were killed on the job, okay. Just performing their job-related tasks. In those situations, what is the uh, settlement, that a, a general range of the settlement? It, it can vary. It can vary f depending on uh, what their actions were and how it may have caused or contributed to hundreds of thousands of dollars to millions of dollars. So we're not talking about $10,000, $5,000. We're talking about substantial amounts of money. In the event a settlement was brokered, yes, sir. And then the life insurance policy, that's through MetLife Insurance. What's the, is there a standard amount, or is that an, an employee makes application for a particular amount? No, there's a standard amount that I believe all employees, that all employees get just by virtue of being a, a company employee. Uh, and I'm going off memory here, but I believe the base level of that is $20,000. And then I believe that if an employee dies at work, there's an additional fifteen dollars or $16,000 associated with that policy. Okay. So somewhere in the area of $30,000. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, is that a... A benefit that BNSF applies or just provides to all its employees without yeah. them having to make application and my question would be say I work for your company the first day I start work am I given that benefit yes sir okay. now, does the company provide any other life insurance beyond the one you've just talked about just natural or to all its employees there are other options available, but those are an election by an employee, and they bear the cost for that. Okay. Thank you. Nothing further. Chair? With regards to the life insurance policy in this case, <clears throat> do you have any knowledge as to the amount of life insurance that's actually paid out on the claim? No, sir, I do not. Okay. That's not done through the railroad. Yes, sir. But if you, you're would somewhere around about thirty thousand sound about right? Yes, sir. And someone in Rob, you don't know what Rob Lamone was making on an annual basis for the railroad at that time. I know that he was a high wage earner, but I would be speculating as to a, a dollar amount. When you say high wage earner, what what are you talking about? High wage. In my estimation, something probably eighty to a hundred thousand dollars a year. And based on your experience in dealing with benefits uh, for railroad employees, um, when is the the average retirement age for railroad employees? If they have their thirty years of service, it's at age sixty. So if Rob Lamone was in, say. Uh, late 30s at the time, he had at least another 20-some years uh, or thereabouts before he even qualified for his retirement? Before we reach age 60, yes, sir. And uh, he was making somewhere, you said, between eighty and $100,000, is that right? Again, I think he was a high wage earner, and you asked me what I thought that was, and I classified it between those numbers, yes, sir. So it could have been over the course of that time frame working uh, for BNSF, he would make somewhere around about $2 million, is that be a, right? Be a significant amount of money, yes, sir. Okay. And he would also be, there would also be contribu contributions to the retirement that would uh, it also increase his retirement that's available. Would that be right? Yes, sir. Okay. And the amount of money that he's, that he's in, would receive, the, receive upon retirement? Yes, sir. Step down, Mr. Platten. Thank you. Thank you.
Ms. Fern, can you step up to the podium for me, please? Very good. Would you raise your right hand, please, for me? Come on up, have a seat. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Can you tell us your name and spell your first and last name for the record? Yes, Emily Hearn, E-M-I-L-Y-H-E-A-R-N. Very good. You're with us, counsel. Good morning, Ms. Hearn. Good morning. Uh, what is the name of your older brother? Jonathan Hearn, H-E-A-R-N. How much older than you is Jonathan? Uh, three and a half years. Now, when he was younger, where did he go to school? Uh, Arrow Christian Academy, um, where I attended as well. What type of school is that? Is this a standard public school? Um, no, we were homeschooled uh, with um, my parents having a private school with the state. So we had a principal and a teacher and everything, but considered a homeschool. So the school was, your parents were in charge of the school? Yes, and it was registered with the state as a private school. When did you first meet Sabrina Lamont? Um, I was visiting home from Texas. I um, lived there for several years out of high school. And um, I was in Costco one day with Jonathan, and she, he introduced me to Sabrina. And I can't remember if I had heard of her before. Um, I, I you know I had, um, but just kind of in passing, I didn't know much more. Okay. You see her in court today? I do. You just point to where she's at. She's here. Can you point her out for me, please? Yes, she's here at the... Can you get it for the record, the defense? When you uh, first saw Miss Lamone in Costco, you're walking with your brother. Do you know the time frame? 2012, 2013. Um, <laughs> um, I'm not really sure the time frame on that. I'm sorry. Let's try this. Uh, when did you get back from Texas? Um, I was visiting home for leave. I came home three times while I was in the two years I was there. So I believe it would have been um, maybe my Christmas visit home. Um, in what year? <laughs> Let's see. It would have been 2000 and maybe 14, 13. Okay. Now, besides that time you saw... Sabrina Lamone at Costco, did you see her again prior to the date that her husband was killed? Not that I remember. Now, in the time frame that we're talking about, did you discuss Sabrina Lamone with Jonathan? On several occasions. What was the nature of those conversations? Not the specifics, but what did, were you talking about? Um... Usually it was just um, light conversation in, in passing um, about a, a gal he knew, Sabrina. Um, and then when I had met her, um, he would just reference her, uh, never in specifics about them spending much time together, but I knew that they were close. Um, and I knew that she was married and had kids and... Um, just details of um, her situation a little bit that he, you know, he was hearing from her. So then he was saying to me um, of her home life maybe not being um, as grandiose as people maybe viewed it to be. Maybe that there was some abuses going on or such. Now, after Robert Lamone was killed. You were, when did you see Sabrina? That would be August 17, 2014. I believe it was about two weeks after, maybe three. And um, 
Jonathan and I, I um, work as a florist, and so I had made her up a large bouquet. Um, we had talked on the phone after Robert had died, and um, I took her a bouquet of flowers and um, spent the evening there with her family and at her home. Now, prior to going to Miss uh, Lamone's home, had you been with uh, Jonathan in Costco where he learned of Robert's passing? Yes. Okay. Uh, when did that happen? I believe that was about the same time frame. I think it was uh, probably just two or three days before I um, went to her home that I was in Costco with Jonathan. Um, so that day, describe what you did with Jonathan. Um, I was caring for my grandmother at the time who had had a serious stroke. She was paralyzed. And so um, I was off that day from work, so my mom offered to stay with my grandmother so that I could do some errands with Jonathan, and he mentioned wanting to stop by Costco. And um, so uh, we went, and there was a gal, um, who uh, Joe, who was the head over the, the ladies who give out samples, which is what Sabrina did, and um, uh, I said, oh, where's Sabrina, you know, to Joe? Um, and Joe played on the same softball team as one of the firefighters who worked with Jonathan. So, um, and she said, oh, didn't you hear? And um, she went into um, the details of that um, Robert had passed away several weeks before. And I started tearing up because I'm a very kind-hearted person. And I was just so distraught that Sabrina, who had been so welcoming, um, and kind to me when we had met that first time um, that he had passed away and Jonathan as well was very visibly taken aback by it. Okay. How did Jonathan act? He acted very surprised and um, very um, kind of shook up. He's a very level-headed and calm person and he, um, he kind of had a tremor in his voice and um, was just very visibly kind of uh, shaking and acting very shocked as well. Did it seem genuine to you? It did. You said that you took flowers to Miss Lamone? I did, yes. Um, did your brother go with you? Yes. How regularly would you visit Miss Lamone uh, in Helendale with your brother? After Robert died, yes. um, it's looking back, it wasn't as much as I felt that it was. Um, I would say probably less than 10 times in those months after Robert passed. Okay. Now, the, when you would go to Helendale, was this you uh, saying to Jonathan, hey, I want to go see Sabrina, or did Jonathan want you to come along with him? Um, I think there may have been a time that I even went myself. I just had such a warm spot in my heart for the family, for the kids. I remember taking um, Liliana to her little Girl Scouts thing one day while I was there. Um, I think that Jonathan probably was initiating the few visits that we had, um, but it, was, it didn't feel unnatural or forced at the time. Uh, so you became friendly with Sabrina. I in very this. much so did, yes. And there was just... Um, from her parents and from her family and cousins and or nephews, I guess, was just, it, you know, my family's very kind and welcoming, and I felt the same from them radiating, so I felt right at home okay. with them for some reason. Now, in this time, did you ask Sabrina about her relationship with Robert? I did not. Did you ask her about her lifestyle at all? I did not. Okay. Did you ever talk to Jonathan about what type of relationship he had with Sabrina? And this would be around the time of Robert's death. Death. Um, you know, I, um, I was under the impression that... Their contact um, had stopped. Jonathan, um, 
I don't remember exactly the timing of it, probably sometime around March or so. No, I'm not sure exactly. I was still um, in Texas, I believe, at that point. Or no, I wasn't. No, so around March, he had started going to a new church, and I had started coming with him occasionally. And um, I thought that their contact had stopped because I felt at the time that he had gotten a little closer with her than he had um, wanted. And so I was under the impression he had cut off contact. So up and until... Robert's death, I did not know they were still in contact. Okay. When you say March, are we talking about March 2014? Yes, I believe that um, March or April or somewhere around there. I think June is when I started attending the church a little more regularly. Now, in that time frame immediately following Robert's death, were you aware whether or not Jonathan was spending the night at Sabrina's house? Um, I didn't know that he was. I spent the night there with him one evening, and um, we just crashed on her couches. Um, it was probably 3 or 4 in the morning that we had finished up dinner and talking and um, getting the kids to bed and stuff. And so um, we were going to uh, go to a church that she had attended, with her family the next day, and so um, we just, uh, you know, spent the night on our couches. Okay. And the time that you spent with Jonathan at Sabrina's house, uh, were they affectionate with each other? Hold hands, kiss, that kind of stuff in front of you? Um, no, only one time did he have his arm around her. Um, they were sitting, you know, close on the couch, but not um, unlike the kids were sitting there as well. Um, at that time, did you get an impression that they were a couple? I think um, I think I knew that it was t transitioning towards that. I obviously was unaware of the situation and what had occurred, but I kind of um, I thought at the time he was trying to fill a void in in the children's lives and be there to financially and emotionally support the whole family, um, do fun things with them, and keep their mind off of it. I didn't think much more of it than that. Um, did they tell you about the future of their relationship? Um, at the time and before that, um, I know that our, our family's been in construction forever, and I knew that we had in the works to build some houses and stuff, and he talked about you know, having a family there one day when he built his eventually. Um, I don't think that he ever specifically, that I remember specifically mentioned, her name and connection with that, but I knew that he was, the ball was rolling in some sense to get those built in the next couple of years. Sure. Take our morning recess there, ladies and gentlemen. 15 minutes. Remember not to form or express any opinion or discuss the case.
All right, we'll go back on the record in People versus Lamone. She's present in court with her attorney and the people are represented. We do have Miss Emily Hearn on the stand, still in the road, subject to direct by Mr. Smith and all the folks with two in the box. Mr. Smith, if you'd like to continue. You recall speaking with Detective Meyer, seated to my right? Yes, I do. Okay. Do you recall him showing you some photographs uh, from surveillance footage near where Robert was killed? Yes, I do. Okay. Do you know what type of vehicles your brother owned at the time? Yes, he owned a motorcycle and a Ford F-150 or a 250, you know, one of the Fs. Now the photographs that you were shown by uh, Detective Meyer, do you recall what type of vehicle was pointed out to you? Yes, there was a motorcycle pointed out to me. Now did you recognize the motorcycle at all or was it too grainy? It, it was grainy and I noted that there you know were similarities but that it was hard to tell from the photographs and i've pointed out a thing a few things that could have been different you know now you said that you were present when you learned or you were in costco when you learned about the death of robert yes okay. uh, your brother was there with you as well between that point and when he was arrested, did you ask Jonathan if he had killed Robert? Um, there were a few conversations uh, that his uh, best friend Parker and I had with Jonathan. I can't quite remember if all of them were together with the both of us or if I asked some myself, uh, but I, I do remember saying, you know how this, this looks, like you were spending a lot of time with a guy's wife before he's murdered and um, you're gonna be under scrutiny and where were you and he just I was I was home that night you know and I I think that um, Parker was a little more direct with him in his uh, approach man to man um, but again Parker and I've discussed many times how uh, we didn't think see anything from him that uh, let us, you know, any quivers or any, you know, anything that would imply that he was um, not telling the truth. Okay. Did your brother begin to act differently after the death of Robert? I, I think he did somewhat, but not in big major ways. Okay. Uh, did he act more religious? Did he act more mature? Anything of that nature? Um, there was some of that. I accounted that to just understanding yet again the gravity of life and how it can be taken so quickly. And I feel like we were all a little... Um, my grandmother passed during that time. It had been 11 months with me taking care of her on hospice and working full-time. And I think the whole m uh, mindset of the whole family was a little more grave at the time. So it's hard to, it's hard to pinpoint if he was doing that just because or, you know, why he was that way. Now, did you speak with Sabrina specifically about, I know I asked this before, but her lifestyle with Robert? I'm trying to remember because I can't quite differentiate between um, things that I've been told <laughs> through Jonathan and things that I um, may have heard from Sabrina. Um, if I was to provide you with a, a report from your interview, uh, would that assist you in refreshing your memory? It may. Okay. It's been a couple years.
just turn, if you could read the uh, fourth paragraph just to yourself. Just see if that refreshes your recollection. Yes, somewhat. What did you tell detectives uh, Sabrina had told you about her relationship with Roth? Um, I told them that um, much of my information or most of it had been provided through Jonathan, but that Sabrina, um, during some of our visits at her at her residence or out to eat or whatever, um, I th I'm thinking I remember one specific time when she uh, was talking about... Um, kind of getting wasted a little bit and um, how that would happen on the regular and that there were liberties that were taken with some of their friends and stuff and getting a little too loose and, and wild and um, nothing was ever like, let me tell you about, you know, but it was more just kind of things would come up in um, conversation about, oh yeah, that one time that we... Blah, blah, blah. So I think just from gathering of certain information, I, I was able to obtain that there was a lot of, like, kind of loose frivolity that was happening. Okay. Now, did you speak with Sabrina, Sabrina in the context of wanting to move on, or her wanting to move on from that type of lifestyle to a new lifestyle? I remember um, that night I spent at her, her house on the couch. I was uh, getting ready the next morning, and I was sitting on her sink uh just watching her put on her makeup and she teared up a little bit and um she said i i think the best is yet to come <laughs> and sorry and um i think that she generally wanted to move on from what had happened and i of course un <laughs> unaware of all that had happened I um I wish the same for her as well, and for if if we were going to be part of that process as a family, I thought that that would be just wonderful. What did? Oh, you okay? Yeah. Okay. Comes up at the weirdest times. <laughs> Now, what did you think about the speed at which Sabrina and Jonathan's relationship was progressing as you saw it after Robert's death? You understand the question? I do. Oh. Um, at the time, I was not too phased by the speed at which um, it was occurring because I think I have yet to understand why I, um, as a kind of often untrusting person, uh, fell in love with the family so much as well. Um, I, I, I think because I was in the middle of it, I didn't really think that it was moving incredibly rapidly. But once you're removed outside of it, everything takes a little more perspective and um, seems very abnormal. So as you sit looking back, um, now it seems like it was uh, quickly progressing. Yes. Um, Detective Grantham that night um, asked me, well, how long you know, have you really spent with her? Why, why do you care for her so much? And um, I was stumped by that question because it, uh, suddenly he was asking me to question a lot of things. Um, and... I was very unsure as to why um, that progression had happened so quickly with myself as well. Do you recall telling De uh, Detective Grantham as well <laughs> that you were told by Sabrina and Jonathan that sometime in January or February 2015, uh, 
They planned on going to Sabrina's parents to inform them they were going to start spending time one-on-one. -on -one. Yes, that was a conversation I had with Jonathan. I don't think I would have specifically remembered it. I guess I missed the beginning of her answer, Your Honor. I apologize. Try to rephrase your question. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, do you recall speaking with Detective Grantham about what you were told by Sabrina and Jonathan as to their plans for their relationship? I don't. Okay. Uh, would it refresh your recollection to review uh, the report? Now, what did Sabrina tell you about what their plans were for the future uh, in the following year for their relationship? Noted, Mr. Terry. Based on what you read that refreshed your recollection, tell us what Sabrina told you, not what Jonathan told you. Okay. I was going to make the differentiation myself. I, I don't think that Sabrina specifically had spoken of that. I just knew that Jonathan had said they were in oh, agreement. Oh. Okay. Next question. <laughs> You're welcome. Did you ever speak with Sabrina about her relationship with Jonathan? I don't think in any great detail. Okay. When did you become aware of the extent of their relationship? Um, their extent, meaning the time spent together or? Yes. Um, usually as soon as it occurred, I was... Um, Again, um, in the front house, taking care of my grandparents and Jonathan at a house on the same property. And so his coming and goings were usually, we'd see each other almost every day. Um, so he would mention that they had you know, gone to the beach Jonathan, tonight. Um, Jack, alter hearsay. Sustained. Nothing further, Aaron. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Terry, Thank you. You're welcome. Good morning. Ms. Hearn, uh, I want to go a little bit back in, in the background with you and your brother and your life kind of growing up. Yes. Okay. Now, you indicated that there's about a three and a half year difference between you and your older brother. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I understand it. You mentioned a Christian Academy. What was it? What Christian Academy? Arrow Christian Academy. I'm sorry? Arrow Christian Academy. Can you spell the first part? A R R O W. Oh, okay. And that was actually was that what was your your parents had registered for your homeschooling at with the Board of Education? Yes. Just okay. to you know to cover all of our bases, make sure we're very legal with everything. Not okay. doing testing and all that with the state. So competency testing and those types of things. Yes. And um, did you ever at any point uh, go to any type of public schooling? No. Both uh, you and your we brother did were privately taught yes. at home? Yeah, after school biology with other, you know, at a Christian school. We were in, 
integrated with other people, um, but not specifically in a pub public school ever. Okay. Was it private uh, Christian schools that you attended, or was it just certain classes that you had to go to, like a lab science? Uh, it wasn't even that we had to. We just, you know, to be with our friends and to sign up for it. We didn't specifically have to go to them, but yes. And as part of uh, your parents' homeschooling of you and your, your brother, um, were biblical studies incorporated into your homeschooling? Absolutely. Okay. Would it be safe to say that your family is, uh, and you were raised to be, um, uh, I don't want to get too far, but fairly devout Christians? Yes, Absolutely. And your brother, brother Jonathan, well, Jonathan, during the time that you were growing up, would you consider him to be a devout Christian? Yes. I don't think that we're unaware that sin exists even after you got a Christian, you know, but everybody has their, their moments of failure. But yes, absolutely, we kind of all adhered as a family to these principles. And uh, specifically relating to the Old and New Testament, is that right? Um, uh, what does that mean specifically? I'm sorry. The Old Testament uh, being uh, books like Genesis and uh, through into... Uh, the last one? Yeah. <laughs> All the way through the uh, New Testament, which includes uh, books uh, by uh, Christian scholars. Yes, I, the inerrancy of the scripture as it being penned by God himself through his writers. Yes, I okay. would say that the, okay. the, the, in it being that we believed in the whole thing, not just the new as opposed to the old, if that's what you're asking. No, I wasn't asking that. Okay. What I was asking is we're talking about both aspects of the uh, Christian Bible, right? Right, yes, okay. okay. <laughs> both books is what I'm Okay, yes. Yeah. And so throughout... Your, your lifetime and, and, and to today, you're very devout in your, your faith. Is that being accurate? Yes. And your brother always uh, was very devout in his faith. Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes, that is a yes. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you like I tell everyone who does that. That young lady there sitting in front of you, uh, she's got to take down everything we say, okay? okay. Absolutely, thank so you. So it has to be a yes or a no, okay? Now, you indicated um, there was a period of time where you were living in Texas, is that right? Yes, there was. Okay. And that was approximately two years? Approximately, yes. Okay. And then at some point, and you believe it was, was it after Christmas of 2013 that you moved back um, to California? Uh, it was just a visit that I was home when I met Sabrina, but I did move back in August of 20. 13, I believe. Okay. So it was before the Christmas that you, uh, where you met her, I think you said, uh, you moved back in August of 2013? I did, yes. Okay. So with regards to the Christmas, you said it was a visit that you met her. Mm -hmm. So if you're already living here in December of 2013, it would have been before that time frame that you met her? Yes. Yeah, so I... I I couldn't quite remember the year, but it would have been when I was visiting home. Um, everything's a little jumbled. I'm sorry. I should have pinned that down a little bit more. That's all right. Okay. It's been a few years. Trust me, and wait till you're my age. It gets worse. <laughs> okay. Um, now, you met her, and Jonathan introduced you to her one time when you were in Costco. Is that right? Yes. At some point, I don't want to pin down a date, but yes. <laughs> Sometime when you're visiting from Texas. I believe so, yes. Okay. Well, during the time you were living in Texas, you said you came back to California approximately three times. Is that right? I believe so. Okay. I'm not going to hold your feet to the fire on that, but we'll assume okay. that that's your best recollection. <laughs> okay. Is that okay? Okay, thank you. Okay. Was it always during the holidays, or was it different events? Um, one time I flew home to get drive my car out there, um, you know, just, just it happened to be different things. I don't think it was always a holiday. Okay. But it was at some time when you were in 
coming, visiting from Texas that Jonathan introduced you to Sabrina. Yes. Okay. Now, um, in your life growing up uh, with your family, did you guys have pets? Pets? Yes. Yes, we uh, did. Uh, dogs, cats? Objection, Ralph. Asked if there were dogs or cats, Mr. Smith? Get to where you're going, Mr. Terry. That's fine. Well, it's just preliminary. I understand. Objection yeah, will be overruled, Mr. Thanks. Smith. So. What type of animals did you have as pets? Um, we had a, a hurt crow through when I was about five years old that my mom had had since she was 16. That was part of the family, Napoleon. And then we had um, Scooby, another bird. And then we had Buffy, a dog, um, a little mutt all growing up. And then um, Sadie was a rescue dog that we had gotten um, and passed away about 16 years ago now. <coughs> so, and now, other ones since. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? And other dogs since. Oh, okay. And cats. <laughs> now you said that you, with Jonathan, you discussed uh, Sabrina, I said, you, I think you said uh, a number of times. Several occasions. I yes. Uh, what time frame were these discussions that you had with Jonathan about Sabrina? Um, I, I don't genuinely remember um, much details about them other than just some of the details of what was talked about. Okay. With regards to those discussions, were those before Rob uh, Lamont uh, was killed or was it after? Um, there was some before and some after. <laughs> oh. Now, with regards to your brother's um, personal or love life, did he was he uh, open with you about his love life and women he was seeing? Uh, fairly open, I would say, like a good, healthy amount. <laughs> no oversharing, but um, details, yes. Um, prior to meeting Sabrina, were you aware of what other girlfriends he had? Um, I wouldn't say specifically he uh, had any kind of long-term girlfriends, but definitely women that he hung out with on, for extended periods of time and, um, you know, did date things with, but I don't think he ever specifically called any of them his girlfriend. Okay. Well, let me ask you this. Who were some of the women that you knew he was dating prior to uh, having met Sabrina? Do you want names? Or? Yes. Okay. I um, know that when he was in the Fire Explorers, so he would have been a teenager at that point, that Your there were... objection of relevance also existed. Well, let me ask you this. Um, were you aware if around the same time that you met Sabrina, whether or not Jonathan was involved with any other woman that he identified. Yes. Um, shortly before um, Robert's death, um, he and Parker were, oh, I, um, Parker recounted this to me, so I'm not sure if that. No, I'm, I'm asking about what you knew about persons that your brother may have been involved with prior to having met Sabrina. Oh, having met her? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I misunderstood. I thought it was prior to Rob. Shortly or right around, around or about the same time as you met Sabrina. Are you aware of who your brother was seeing then? Oh, you can answer. Were you aware of him seeing any other women when he... Uh, Around the time that she met Sabrina Lamont. Correct. The reason is we, we can't. We can't. One second.
question as phrased to be sustained, Mr. Smith. Mr. Terry, your next question. Yes. I'm going to rephrasing it. At the time that you met Sabrina, when uh, Jonathan introduced you to her at Costco, do you have any personal knowledge as to uh, whether or not your brother was seeing another woman? No, other than things that were said. Okay. From other sources or that your brother told you? My brother, right? yes. You don't have any personal knowledge as to who he's involved? No. Okay. Although so I you, didn't spend much time with him, you know, out and about in his daily life. Just. And he didn't share with you much in the way of what his, how do I put it, romantic or personal life uh, other than his work related and those types of things. Is that right? He did share, but not to an excessive amount. Oh. Like, you know. He wasn't overly sharing. How's that? Right. I feel like a good, respectful amount of the people that he was with, not ever in a like a boastful or um, salacious way, but just in a, you know, this is who I've been talking to or different things like that. Or who I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Huh? Is that a yes? Yes. <laughs> You mentioned uh, that uh, you got information, I'm assuming this is from Jonathan, uh, that uh, Sabrina's life wasn't as grandiose, I think was your term, as it uh, appeared. Is that right? Yes. And your source for that information was through Jonathan? Yes. If nothing that you knew. mentioned that um, you found out about Robert's death when you went with Jonathan to Costco, is that right? Yes. And that was through uh, Sabrina's supervisor? Yes. You indicated that uh, Jonathan Visibly shaken, yes. And uh, you said, I believe you said he was it appeared to be also uh, distraught. Is mm -hmm. that right? Is that he a yes? Did, yes, he did. A, I don't know if I said that before, but yes, he did appear that way. And to you, it appeared to be genuine. Is that right? It did. And you've known your brother your entire life, right? I have. <laughs> and you know him well. To some extent, yes. <laughs> and your brother never told you, and you didn't believe that he was in any way involved in the murder of Rob Lamone. Is that right? That is right. That is correct. You actually had those discussions with him. Is that right? Yes. And pointed to the ass or told him that it didn't look good because he was going over to see Sabrina. Is that right? Not that he, not because he was currently doing it, but because he had in the past had spent time with her, and that that's what wouldn't look good. But he continued to go over to see her even uh, after you guys had found out about uh, Rob's death. Is that yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, you indicated that uh, when you met Sabrina and the kids, uh, when you went over there with Jonathan, that uh, you were immediately taken with her and the kids, right? And her family. They're good people, right? They're, um, I would say, um, yes, it, generally. There was some stuff, you know, that would come up that, Later, you think about and realize, like, oh, that wasn't maybe the, the greatest thing, but um, 
you know, just kind of a fun and welcoming atmosphere. Definitely not the atmosphere I had come from as far as maybe a little more loose and stuff, but um, at the time I was loose as well, so it didn't, you know, it wasn't... Um, you felt relaxed and at home. Absolutely, it. yes. And Sabrina was a genuinely uh, welcoming and uh, open person with you. Oh, yes, yeah, she was so kind. Now, the times that you went over there with Jonathan, uh, you mentioned the first time you, you're a florist and you made up a bouquet of flowers mm -hmm. uh, and gave that to Sabrina. Is that yes. Right? And um, was that the, the same day that you actually stayed uh, at her house? No, it was not. Okay, it was a subsequent day that you and uh, went over with Jonathan? I believe it was two months later or so. And uh, Jonathan's, uh, or I mean, Sabrina's sister was there? Yes. And her parents were there? Not that night. Not no, that night? But... Okay. Um, did you... And Jonathan stay overnight that time uh, when you went over to Sabrina's when her sister was there? I, I, I do not think so. Oh, no, I only spent the night one time, okay. but I can't remember for sure if her sister was there or not before. Um, um, I'm pretty sure she was not. Okay. Was there a time where Jonathan, with you, uh, basically said that he wanted to make dinner for her parents? Yes. And was I helped that with her that. Home? Yes. Okay. So her parents were there, and you and Jonathan arrived. Or her parents there... arrived after we were there. Okay. So Jonathan and you went to Sabrina's home, and you told Sabrina, or Jonathan told Sabrina, that he wanted to make dinner for her parents. Is that right? I believe it was already set up before. Um, like I knew coming into the visit that her parents were going to be coming for dinner. Okay. Was her sister also there? No. Her sister, I think, had maybe dropped by earlier in the night and had given me a bunch of pairs of shoes for myself that she had not wanted anymore because we have the same size. <laughs> you indicated at one point um, that uh, during March of 2000, was your impression that Jonathan and Sabrina had cut off contact? Is that right? I don't remember the exact time, but I just was aware that they weren't in contact, to my knowledge, anymore. Now, with regards to uh, Jonathan's motorcycle, um, how long does he have that motorcycle, if you know? I don't know. The exact um, time frame. I just know he's had it for a while before. Okay. Has he always uh, had uh, forgiven stenciled on the side of that since he's had the you're aware of? Uh, he did it himself. He's quite an artist, and um, it was a salvage title bicycle, um, motorcycle, and he uh, fixed it up as soon as he, you know, shortly after getting it um, and re, re um, like, Put the tank back out you know it was all crushed in so right. he stretched it back out and repainted it himself and did wrote that forgiven on there himself so shortly after he refurbished the motorcycle he stenciled that yes. or airbrushed that onto the side of the tank mm -hmm. and there was also i think uh, a cross on that Is yes that right? mm -hmm.
interactions with Sabrina, uh, the speed at which their relationship was, I believe you said, going, um, that at the time that didn't phase you too much, right? It did not phase me. Because you knew they'd already been somewhat involved mm -hmm. prior to Robert's death. Correct. And Jonathan was, I'm sure, trying to be supporting for Sabrina because of the uh, distress she was feeling after Robert's death? Yes, and because of what I had heard about her, you know, past with Robert, I was not so shocked because if you're in a loveless marriage or what, you know, I assumed she um, wasn't exactly feeling the love with Robert, it would be easy to kind of move on with somebody you did love and who could um, protect you. And so I didn't, it wasn't strange for me initially that she was able to move on so quickly either. Um, you know, how you hear of marriages with, they're in it for the kids or whatever like that. So I kind of just put it off as, as being that instead of realizing really how quickly it actually was and how incredibly strange that was that someone could move on so quickly, even if they were in a loveless marriage. Well, and the source of you believing that Ms. Lamone didn't her love her husband was through Jonathan? Yes. That was the impression he gave you. Is that right? Yes, I'm not necessarily. I shouldn't say loveless. I couldn't quite think of the word, but just in a, in a marriage that maybe um, didn't have as much love, uh, you know, single, solitary, monogamous love that many people desire. So, when it, your information as to belief as to Ms. Lamone's relationship with her husband was based on information that Jonathan gave to you. Is that right? It is. But also, like I mentioned to Mr. Smith, that um, she, she did mention that there was the wild parties and the loose lifestyle and that Rob would have her drink more than she wanted to. And, oh, stop, Rob. You know, it wasn't... It wasn't only based on Jonathan. Initially it was, but she filled in a few of the gaps with a few things she said. And based on a few things that she said, you believe that she no longer loved her husband? No. I think when I said that, I, that loveless was the wrong word, um, it wasn't that she didn't love him. It was maybe she didn't care for him as much as people thought she did. Or perhaps that's your interpretation, right? Your Lisa. That's how you're interpreting. Is that right? Mr. Smith? He's testifying. It's basically our testimony. Just uh, rephrase the next question, sure. Mr. Chair. You're assuming, based upon the information you have, that um, she may not love her husband as much. Yes. Okay. Everyone does, based on what they see to be truth. And... Your impressions for that are primarily through Jonathan, right? Primarily, yes. Okay. And with regards to Ms. Lamone's feelings about her husband, you don't have any personal knowledge of whether or not she actually still loved her husband or not. Is that right? I did not. I never met her and Rob together, so I would have no... No reference for that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. No further questions at this time, John. Mr. Smith. Uh, Ms. Hearn. Yes. Uh, your impressions that uh, Sabrina Lamone didn't care for her husband as much as people thought and that she moved on quickly, that was based upon what Jonathan told you, your conversations with her, and what you also observed with Sabrina, correct? The first two, yes. The observance with Sabrina um, was only the, the fact that she was moving on so quickly and that the kids were so welcoming to, uh, you know, another family and a strong male figure and a very kind and 
my, my brother's the kindest man that I know, or, you know, and uh, so, of course, I felt anyone would fall in love with that, you know, um, the children as well. Okay. So you testified that uh, Sabrina was kind, welcoming. Yes. Okay. And your brother as well. He's very much kind and welcoming. Like none other that I've ever, um, you, you know. Has your opinion changed since you found out he killed Robert Lamont? It's it's shaken it a little bit, um, but I see I see strains of the man that I've known all along. <laughs> Sorry, and I don't think that it's um completely ruined my image of of him. It's just definitely um, brought a lot of questions and um, brought a lot of mistrust or distrust of people, but. Um, the, the truths I knew about him to be true, even during this time, he, um, it's hard because it's such a paradox between the two because um, he was the most loyal and kind and would go out of his way for anyone. Um, to the deaths of people, you know, on his shift passed away, he went to their funeral and met with their family and um, would go check on people in the hospital weeks later and he just had such a, a vibrancy about him and a, a depth to him that many don't have. And I think in general he went for um, people who had a little more depth to them as well and a little more struggle, not the frivolous girls who life had come easily to, but to people who had struggled a bit more. And we had had, you know, struggles in our family, and I understood that, because that's what I go for as well, somebody who's not shallow, and I felt that with Sabrina, you know, and so I assumed that it was the typical, because the women he typically went for were, had a little bit of baggage and a little bit of depth. Nothing further, on. Jerry, based on that, anything, sir? brother better than a lot of people, including Sabrina, right? It's a different kind of knowing. Um, you grew up together, right? Yes, but you, you give yourself much more emotionally to the one that you love. <laughs> it's not. I don't even think that it could be on the same spectrum. I knew parts of him that she could never know. But. No. And I understand. Okay. Um, but you knew him, you thought. I don't think it's even well. a past tense. I, knew, I know parts of his character um, that, that are still true whether or not, you know, this happened. This obviously puts a lot of hurdles into my relationship, but that there are parts of him that did not change. said he was uh, the most loyal and kind person you've ever met. Yes. Is that true? It no. is true. And uh, he, you indicated he went, he tended to be attracted to uh, not frivolous girls, I think you said, is that right? Yes. Uh, there's, that's a broad <laughs> term, but. <laughs> it can be, can it? It can be. Um, and that he went for women who had a little bit of baggage and depth to them, I think you said. Is that right? Yes. Did you, from women that you actually observed your brother dating or knew your brother was dating, um, did he tend to go for women who were a little bit older than him? The, um, I feel like he felt love was for everyone and that uh, I don't th think it mattered because he dated girls younger than him, um, his age and... I think older a couple of times. I don't think he specifically ever brought up people's ages, though. I just knew a few of the girls from, you know, before they actually dated him. So I knew. And 
you knew your brother, and you had no inkling that he was capable of committing cold-blooded murder? I wouldn't say that. Um, when I met with Detective Meyer and Grantham the day that um, Jonathan was arrested, I, I, I don't know if they were taken back by our family's response, but it wasn't one of complete aghast, and this could never be. It was one, um, because of the way we were raised, that said everyone is capable of things that you don't think that they're capable of, and that doesn't train you know, the foundational truth we have in God. And so while we were very shaken by what we were hearing, I don't think that we ever said, this could never be, he could never have done this. Um, from the beginning, we said, all humans are capable of very egregious offenses. And if this is true, this is horrible. And I think my dad even, you know, spoke and to the spoke to the punishment that should await somebody who does this sort of crime but that that didn't stop us from saying that Jonathan could have done it not because it was in his character not because we actually thought that he could do that but because all people are capable of doing things that you didn't think that they could and I understand that and I I know that to be a fact uh, based on what I do your line of work <laughs> but with regards to your own brother who you knew so well yes no I mean not until we heard the confession did we um, I mean you even still try to find a way that it's not true because it just does not make sense um, with the man that I know thank you Turn with, stay in contact with the prosecutor in case we need you back. You don't need to wait around the hallway. You can go home. If we need you back, we'll call you. Thank you. Any objection to get a seven-minute hard head start on lunch? Hearing none. Is everybody back at 1.30? Remember not to form or express an opinion or discussion.